you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Well, we're in our first lesson of this series, Rumors, and Pastor Becky has already started the rumor that it's going to be good. (laughs) I'm excited about it. A rumor, first, has anybody ever heard a rumor? (laughs) Anybody ever shared one? (laughs) A rumor is a currently circulating story of uncertain truth. It's what a rumor is when we define it. And most of us have been impacted by rumors. In one way or another, a rumor has been out there that's impacted our lives. And how a rumor is received determines its level of impact. If it's received well and as true, then the rumor can have a massive impact. And if it's not, then it has very little impact. How many have ever heard of the rumor of the alligators that live in the sewer? of New York City or other big cities. I've heard that rumor. In in fact, they were able to trace that rumor back to its origin and apparently started in the 30s in New York City and and has gone since then. More recently, I heard that people, parents, have used that rumor to say to their little children that alligators live in the sewer system. They come out at night around your bedtime. (laughs) And if you get out of your bed, you put yourself in danger. But it, ironically, this species of alligator cannot climb into beds. So as long as you stay in bed, you're safe. Apparently that's a rumor out there. There's a new rumor I heard, or maybe it's not that new, I don't know, apparently it's quite old, but I heard the rumor this, this week, I'd never heard it before, apparently Nicolas Cage is a time-traveling vampire. <laughs> Who knew? And I, they showed me proof of this online. And what you see online is undoubtedly true. <laughs> they had a picture of Nicolas Cage and other very famous people who many years ago had their picture taken, and there's an uncanny resemblance to Nicolas Cage, so there you go. <laughs> I was affected by a rumor years ago when I was in ninth grade. I was in my fourth high school, and I was trying like crazy to make friends and couldn't seem to make any friends. And I'm a very kind, compassionate, and approachable person. That's your spot to say amen, pastor. Uh, and so anyway, uh, I, was, I, was, uh, I, I was working on making friends and couldn't seem to make any. And finally, in a biology class one day, this kid named Donald was sitting in front of me. And he said, I said, hey, Donald, you know, what's going on? I can't seem to make any friends in this high school. And I was just curious you know, is there something I'm doing wrong? And he said, well, we all know what you are. I said, can you tell me what I am? And he said, yes, you're a narc, an undercover narcotics officer. And I, I said, what? He said, well, are you a narc? I said, if I was a narc, would I tell you I was a narc? That seems to be self-defeating right there, ending my career. I said, but why do you think I'm an arc? He said, well, you don't look like you're 15 or 16 years old. And I looked kind of like this when I was 15 or 16 years old. (laughs) So he had a point. Um, And my siblings all said I was born 35, both in attitude and in looks, apparently. And and so I said, well, uh, I can show you my driver's license. He said, well, that could all be fake. I said, okay, true. I said, well, anything else? He said, yeah, a guy saw you put, I used to wear cowboy boots all the time. He said, a guy saw you put your your gun in your boot. I was like, oh. And and a girl saw you put your badge in your other boot. I was like, well, I can take my boots off right now and show you that I'm, you know, not, I have no gun and no badge. In fact, that's why I don't wear cowboy boots as much anyway now, so you can see I'm not, I'm not, I'm not an arc. So uh, that's why. But, uh, but anyway, and, and after that, I did wonder why every time I went in the, the boys' room, all the guys just scattered out of the room. And I kind of liked that part. I wanted to keep that part. But eventually I dissuaded them and let them know, know that I was not an arc. It was a rumor that had an impact on me. And that's exactly what rumors are meant to do. They're meant to either harm, scare, or impress people. It's what rumors do. In this case, scare people from leaving their beds, tell them an alligator might eat them. Uh, Wouldn't it be better? Never mind. Let's move on. 
or impress people, it would be impressive if Nicolas Cage was a time-traveling vampire. That would be, except for the vampire part, but everything else would be really cool. The third was to harm me. They, they wanted to stop me from making friends for whatever reason. I was the new kid. They were finding a way to pick on me. And, and it did. It stopped me from getting to have friends as quickly in that school. And what rumors really are is people's ability to spread information that can't be substantiated. The words, I have heard, are very powerful words. Because you can say, I have heard, and then follow that up with almost anything. You don't have to cite a source. It doesn't have to be connected to a particular person. But the rumor mill gets started. And as soon as it gets started, it's really hard to stop the rumor mill. No one, in fact, is exempt from this. Even God himself has a rumor mill that's speaking against him. There's a rumor out there that God is dead. And that the only reason why we even talk about God is because he exists only as a creation of humanity's need to explain things. But the scripture that even informs us at all about God tells us in 1 Timothy that he cannot die. And empirically speaking, I feel his presence. And I have talked to him, and I believe that he talks to me. So either I am the craziest person on earth, or God in fact is not dead, but the, even though the rumor says he is. Another rumor is that God is hateful. And he hates everybody who doesn't fit into a particular category of person. But First John tells me that God is in fact is love. And empirically speaking, I have felt his love in my life, and I've seen his love impact the lives of many people. So the rumor is that God is hateful, but all of my experience with God is that he is love. The rumor is that God is angry, and that he wants to punish anybody that doesn't follow all of his arbitrary rules. But the scripture tells me in 1 Timothy that God wants everyone to be saved. So if the entire point of God is, uh, is that he's anger, he, he is angry and he wants to hurt, harm, or punish people, then he would not have to send his son to, be, to offer salvation for our sin. What would be the whole point? Just leave everybody in their sin, punish them all, and be done with it. I've also felt God's conviction in my life. And conviction is not the same thing as condemnation. Condemnation says that you are wrong and can't be made right. Conviction says you did a wrong thing and here's how to get the wrong thing right. The whole point of conviction is so that we can be reconciled to God. The whole point of conviction is to help us get something right that we already got wrong. It doesn't change that we got it wrong, but it helps us get it right. So the enemy uses rumors in this world to scare or dissuade people from following God. He likes to say things that are against God, start the rumor against God, so that we don't follow God. And rumors are most believable when they align with already held beliefs or desires. So we hear something, we hear the rumor, and it kind of aligns with what we already kind of lean towards or we are predisposed to believing or we desire to believe and thereby proves us right. So rumors are most effective when they actually prove our opinion correct. We like them because we like to be right. Maybe I don't want to follow Christ. And so I, I find a couple of people that say the certain rumors that align with what I'm thinking or what I would like to be true. And so I just believe the rumor over the book. And in doing so, I'm alleviated of the pressure, I think, of needing to follow Jesus. But anything that the enemy offers is just a simple copycat of what God has done and a perversion of it. Because the enemy is not a creator, God is the only creator. And so the enemy can't outsmart God. And God has used rumors to bless his people and build his kingdom. In fact, we read about that in Joshua chapter 2. 
We see God allowing rumors to bless his people. Joshua chapter 2 verse number 1 says, So the two men, spies sent by Joshua, set out and came to the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there that night. See, Israel was outside of Jericho. They were going to take the city. But Joshua said, listen, Jericho's big, fortified, and strong. It is a Canaanite stronghold. So I want two spies to go out and search out the land before we go in there. We need to try to get a battle plan together, and I need more information. So the spies get into Jericho, and Jericho is on high alert because they've got a whole nation of people outside their walls wanting to come in. And so they're saying, hey, we need to know who's coming in. So they, they see these two strangers go into Rahab's house. Now, a whole lot of people try to prove that, well, they have a problem with the fact that God would use a prostitute to bless his people. And so they try to prove that Rahab, it wasn't actually a prostitute as we understand prostitution today. But if you go into the original language of that, it simply means prostitute, which has the same meaning today as it did then. And so in this moment, the question then becomes, why would the spies go into Rahab's house? It does not say that the spies sinned in Rahab's house. It said they went there and stayed the night at her house. And that is not the same thing as sinning, and it could have been. In fact, I believe that it, they went there because it would be somewhat unquestioned why strange men would go in and out of a prostitute's home. And so here we go, they're, they're there. But the king hears about it because Jericho's on high alert, and he sends men to go find out who these two guys are. Rahab lies to the king's men because she's hidden the men on the, the roof of her house, and she says to them, hey, they were here, but they've gone now. And so he, she sends the king's men away. Then she goes up onto the roof and begins to have a conversation with the spies. And they flat out ask, why did you just lie to the king's men on our behalf? And this is Rahab's answer. I know the Lord has given you this land, she told them. We are all afraid of you. Everyone in the land is living in terror. Why? For we have heard. There's a rumor going around. How the Lord made a dry path for you through the Red Sea when you left Egypt. And we know what you did to Sihon and Og, the two Amorite kings east of the Jordan River, whose people you completely destroyed. No wonder our hearts have melted in fear. No one has the courage to fight after hearing such things. For the Lord your God is the supreme God of the heavens above and the earth below. So think about how the spies are receiving what she's saying. They're in this Canaanite stronghold. They're spying on the land because Israel is very aware of Jericho's strength. And now they are hearing that Jericho is actually afraid of them based on things that Jericho has heard. They've heard some rumors. And so their victory is being prophesied by their enemy because she believed the rumor. And here's our big idea today. Write this down on your, in your notes in your service guide or download it online. Rumors of God's power and love for his people are true. You know, sometimes rumors are in fact true. It wasn't true that I was a narc. It's not true that Nicolas Cage is a time-traveling vampire. But there are rumors that are actually true. You can catch them and believe them and then you discover that they are exactly what they said they are now a lot of us are afraid of rumors we want to make sure we stay out of rumors but God can use rumors to bless his people and here's the key when you hear rumors that refer to God's weaknesses doubt them when you hear rumors about God's strength believe them Believe them. And I have three thoughts for us today. And thought number one is this, that God plays the long game. When Rahab begins to talk about why she lied to the king's men, she goes back to the Red Sea crossing. God had delivered Israel from Egypt. He did it by allowing them to go to the shores of the Red Sea. Then he spoke to Moses. Moses had held his rod over the sea All night the wind blew and the waters parted. And Israel walked across on dry ground. When the Egyptian army tried to follow them, the waters collapsed down upon the Egyptian army and destroyed them. 
This had all happened before the birth of most of the Israelites that were standing outside of the city of Jericho. The oldest people that were there were extremely young when that miracle had taken place. Because remember, Israel had been here before. They stood on the banks of the Jordan River and they were told, go over and take the land. And they said, we don't think we can do that. And they turned around and God said, okay, because you have not believed me and obeyed my voice, then those who are alive right now and of of decision-making age, they will die before you get back here again. So now all of those people are dead save two, Joshua and Caleb. The two who said we can do this because God said we can. And everybody else that was of decision-making age are gone. And now here's a 40-plus years miracle that happened 40-plus years ago that is being talked about right now by Rahab. A prostitute in Jericho that said, hey, we've heard about God delivering you from the Red Sea, and it has freaked us out. That's what she said in Hebrew. She's saying, we're afraid of you. And I kind of wonder if the spies needed a quick refresh on the story. Because they'd been hearing this. We don't know who these spies are. Maybe they were born when the Red Sea crossing happened, and maybe they weren't. Maybe this was a story they'd heard their fathers and their grandfathers talk about. But you know how it is with stories that you hear from the the long-ago past. They become almost legendary, not really real. And what difference does the story that happened many years ago have on what's going on in my life right now? What difference does a miracle 40 plus years ago have in the situation that we are here in right now? See, Israel was afraid of Jericho. They were concerned about what they were facing. The obstacle before them was massive. There was a natural barrier between them and what God was calling them to do. And they... And they were looking at it with fear, and yet what they discovered is that God was using the rumor to cause the enemy that they feared to actually fear them. Jericho was afraid of Israel. What kind of, what kind of need did your parents or your grandparents have, or maybe you had years ago, that God did a miraculous thing and caused everything to work out in ways you could never have predicted? And maybe you have dismissed that miracle as something that happened that was a one-time and done kind of thing, never to happen again. And could it be that God, even in this moment, is bringing that to your remembrance and saying, hey, a miracle may only take a moment, but its power lasts a lifetime. Its power lasts a lifetime. And so don't forget about the miracle that God has done in your life. No, press into that miracle. Remember, talk about it. Share it. Tell other people about it. You never know how God is going to use that miracle to bless your present and to bless your future. The Red Sea crossing may have only seemed to have significance in the moment when they were crossing. Once Egypt's army was dead... Well, that was that. That was done. But now, 40 plus years later, God is using the same miracle to bring blessing and bring authority into the lives of the Israelites as they're looking at an entirely different barrier. It looks totally different. And yet God is using the same miracle to bring them a blessing in this moment. And that brings us to thought number two, that nature submits to God. Consider the miracle. You have a natural barrier, the Red Sea, that God parts in order to allow Israel to walk through it. Maybe you see a natural barrier in front of you right now. Maybe it's age. Maybe it's sickness or disease. Maybe it's uh, your ability to move and, and your location. Or, or maybe it's a natural ability that you just don't seem to have that's necessary to defeat the situation in front of you in your life right now. Natural barriers seem insurmountable because you and I, we cannot negotiate with nature. 
Now we've been saying from the beginning, talking about Joshua and Ephesians, Joshua is in the natural, what Ephesians is in the supernatural. Joshua, they're taking physical territory. Ephesians, we're taking spiritual territory. But in both books, we see God using his people and moving them into new areas of territory in their lives, in their existence, and against the enemy. And God is offering us a new relationship spiritually. We see the God, we, we, we are tempted to think about the God of the Old Testament, which we talked about recently, and the God of the New Testament. And that God doesn't do the same things in the New Testament as he did in the Old Testament because he has changed us, he has changed his relationship with us spiritually. We're not offering sacrifices of bulls and goats. Now we're accepting salvation by grace through faith in Christ Jesus. And so we kind of think that, well, how he's operating on a global scale has changed entirely, and many people think that God's just kind of hands off instead of being all up in our business. But can I just tell you that God offers us, yes, a unique relationship where we can be saved by grace through faith. Praise the Lord for that. But he has not changed his relationship with creation. He is still creator. He is still Lord. And he is still sovereign over it all. In fact, I've been asked many times about the solar eclipse. People want to know, is this some kind of a revelatory thing? Something that's going to, you know, get us to understand? Is this a plan of God to reveal certain things to us in this world? And I would say, yes, it is God's plan. He set everything in motion and it consists with his plan. And God has used solar events and uh, a natural phenomenon to, pro to project his plan into the world. In his first coming, we saw a star that made such an impact on the world that wise men from the east made a long journey in order to check it out. Now we got people from all over the place apparently driving toward Toledo <laughs> to come check out the eclipse. So could it be that God is using the eclipse to predict something that's coming in connection with his second coming. Yes, it could be. It could be. And yes, it could not be. And here's how I think about it. It doesn't really matter. Because there's only two reasons for me to fear my father coming home or coming to get me. One is if I have an abusive father. Well, when I hear his car come into the driveway, I'm afraid because he's going to hurt me. But my father's not abusive. He loves me. And so when, he, when I hear his car in the driveway or the horn blow when he's showing up, I, I'm going to have nothing but joy in my heart. The only other reason to be afraid of this would be if I'm not ready to meet him. And you and I have the ability to make that decision today. So I'll tell you exactly how I'm going to handle it. Tomorrow, somewhere around the time where all this is going down, I'm going to step outside of my house. I'm going to put on some old paper glasses. For four minutes, I'm going to go, wow. <laughs> then I'm going to step into my house, take off the funny glasses, and go back to doing whatever I was doing before that all happened. <laughs> there it is. Could it be? Yes. Could it not be? Yes. Either way, Jesus is in charge, and I'm not scared of Jesus. I'm looking forward to seeing his return. Praise God. So God commanded the sea, and he said, I want you to part and make way for my people. And when Egypt chased Israel into the sea, they were certain it would stop them. Egypt was chasing Israel right to the shores of the Red Sea, and they thought, ah, oh, a natural barrier. They're not going to be able to get across the sea. So now, as soon as we get up, catch up to them, they're going to be enslaved again. It was a natural barrier that should have worked on Egypt's behalf. It ended up being a natural barrier that worked on the behalf of Israel. Because God said, I'm going to suspend natural laws in this moment. And I'm going to save my people through the natural barrier. And then I'm going to stop their enemies with the natural barrier. 
So what Egypt intended to be Israel's demise, God used as their salvation. Could it be that in your life right now, you're facing a barrier and all you can see is how this barrier is going to take you out. It's going to trap you. It's going to keep you. It's going to stop you from achieving all that God has designed you to achieve. You think that it's all over because there's a natural barrier in front of you. Not not recognizing that God can use the natural thing to become your deliverance. Your deliverance. Sometimes we believe that God has the power over nature. But we doubt his ability to heal our bodies or work on our behalf within the natural span of law. And so we believe spiritually that the cross is enough to save souls from sin, past, present, and future. But we forget that at the same exact time as Jesus was hanging upon the cross, his back had been whipped, and he had taken on stripes. And why did he take on stripes? Well, the Old Testament had already prophesied that it was going to be by his stripes that we were healed. The natural barrier of sickness and disease would come upon our life, but that Jesus, Jesus would take on those stripes so that we could be healed. And we believe that the, the, that the cross was enough to save past, present, and future sin, but sometimes we don't believe that the stripes, that the stripes are still worthy of healing the sickness in our bodies today. That the natural barrier that's in front of our life, that it just... It just has all authority and Christ doesn't do anything about it. Some people say, well, if Jesus can heal the sick today, then then why doesn't he just heal every sick person and there's no sickness? I don't know. That's why he's sovereign. Jesus, uh, God obviously parted the water two times, but we don't see him parting the water every time. Sometimes he chose to do it. Sometimes he chose not to. It was never outside of his capacity to do so, but sometimes it was outside of his will. So why does God choose to heal this person and not heal that person? I cannot tell you. I can tell you that he is sovereign. And so we prayed the prayer of faith. The only thing I can do is take myself out of the equation. I cannot put myself into it. So pray the prayer of faith. And maybe it's not sickness and disease. Maybe there's another obstacle that's naturally occurring in your life. I'm encouraging you, pray the prayer of faith and see what God will do in your world. Thought number three, that God's ways are beyond your ways. They're beyond my ways. God consistently says throughout his scripture, don't fear. But it's easy to be afraid. Even as men and women of faith, It's easy to be afraid because we see the natural barrier. We see the enemy before us. And it's a scary thing. You're looking at the great walls. You're looking at the mighty warriors of Jericho. You're looking at the expanse of the Red Sea. How, How do you put together a battle plan for that? See, some of you right now are facing things that you cannot... You can't logically formulate a battle plan against it. You're seeing it. You know, you're even saying, hey, God can. But you're saying, I I just can't see logically how this is going to work out. What's the battle plan against the sea? What's the battle plan against a city like Jericho that's so much greater than any of your natural forces? And it's interesting to me that Jericho feared what Israel probably was taking for granted at that moment. Because Jericho had heard the rumors. The sea couldn't stop this nation of Israel. And they're sitting there within their walls and they're going, well, hold up. We understand how these walls got here because we built them. But a sea... How do you fight people whose dilemma turns into their deliverance? How do you fight people who when the sea is before them, their God says, make a path. And suddenly the water becomes a highway 
paved with dried mud. And they go across. And then the Egyptian army, one of the most powerful of the day, destroyed behind them. How, how, do, you, how do you possibly make a battle plan against them? So you have Israel over here going, we don't know how to attack Jericho. And Jericho going, if they ever attack. What's before you right now? Could it be that you are fearing what actually fears you and the only thing that makes the difference is who's going to get rid of their fear first? See, here's, here's a reality from my life. I am afraid of mice and rats. I'm afraid of them. And you can judge me if you want to. But I don't get typically afraid as in, ah! I get incredibly violent toward them and I destroy stuff around me in pursuit of that creature I could tell you the whole story I don't have time but I just I just don't like them and they freak me out but see the reason I go with this extra excessive violence which is only a real problem when they're in my air conditioning system Not good. But the reason I go that direction is because if I don't go that direction, I know I'm going to be the dude sitting on top of the counter going, just hoping one at some point they're going to go away. And I just wonder how many of us today are sitting on a counter or acting violently, violently towards things around us. Now, here's what I also know is that on a one-on-one -on -one fight, I'm pretty sure I can take a mouse or a rat. I mean, if I had to, I think I could take it out. And if it had just attacked me, I could get it. I know that it's scared of me. And I know I could fight it and win. But how many of us are letting things that we know we could, or we, we should know that we can defeat, but we're up on the countertop hoping it will just go away, or we're destroying stuff all around us. And at the bottom of it all, we're afraid of the barrier in front of us. How about we trust God to do what only God can do? And we're standing there and that mouse is running at us. And with just calm assurance, we destroy it. I mean, we, uh, we face our fear. Yeah. I don't know what it is in your world. And what it is in your world would look different in mine and mine in yours. Some of you are saying, mice, they're cute. I've got 500 pets, mice at home. That's because you're deranged. We, God can heal you from that too. Yeah. I, I don't know what it is but I can tell you this fear not because just like God opened the path through the sea for Israel and God takes down the walls of Jericho spoiler God can remove the obstacle in front of you that you can't do anything about yourself so I'm going to ask the prayer partners to come and I'm asking you to bow your heads with me if you would and Father, right now in the name of Jesus, we know that you do things beyond our understanding. You have authority over nature. You have the authority over us. I'm asking you that you would heal every sickness and disease. I pray right now as we submit our hearts and our lives to you that we would open ourselves up to the impossible things that you can do and allow you to work in our lives in ways we can't even comprehend or understand to those obstacles in front of us right now. We trust you to remove them so that we can walk forward into the gifts and callings that you've placed within us, that we can fulfill the destiny that you've designed for our lives. I'm going to ask you right now to just talk to the Lord yourself and just name those things that are before you. What obstacle is in front of you right now and just recognize in your prayer father i i know that that thing and you name it that thing 
is no match for you. You're greater than the greatest obstacle in my life. So we humbly today, Jesus, submit our life and submit our fears to you. And we thank you for doing what only you can do in our lives in Jesus' name. And if that's your prayer, would you say amen? Amen. Let's stand to our feet. We're going to close in praise. So I encourage you, if you need prayer, come forward. Let us pray with you.